I invite you to open a Bible with me, if you will, back to the Gospel of John. There are four Gospels in the New Testament that tell us the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we will be reading together in John chapter 20 in just a few minutes. We're glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us, if you're visiting this church family like I am this week, we're especially glad that you're here. And we encourage you to have a Bible open and be ready to follow along with us. We want to listen to God in His Word this evening. There are many other things that we could be doing, but nothing more important than allowing God to shape our thinking and shape our lives, shape our past and our present and especially our future. And we're very, very glad that you are here this evening. I am blessed to visit lots of local churches. And I have been blessed to work with a lot of disciples of Christ over the last uh, nearly two decades. And one thing that seems to be nearly universal, no matter where you go, no matter who you're talking with, young or old, male or female, experienced or not that experienced. We can talk about all of the different things that uh, make us unique, but one thing that seems to be relatively common is this sort of question. What should I do when I doubt? We live in confusing times, and we hear people around us expressing confusion and and doubt and discouragement. And if I'm honest with myself this evening, perhaps I am feeling a certain level of confusion and doubt and discouragement. And the question is, what should I do then? Uh, We have phrased it this evening, not what should I do if I doubt, but what should I do when I doubt? How can I help the people around me who are going through a difficult time with their faith? How can we all find answers to difficult questions that arise? How can we maintain the sort of faith that God would have us to maintain? A very long time ago, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7 said toward the end of his most famous sermon, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it did not fall, that house, because it had been founded on the rock. That's what we're looking for this evening. That sort of stability, the sort of stability that we talked about last night. But this evening, what about when I doubt? I would like to share with you five building blocks that I hope will help you answer that sort of question. Perhaps this evening, Perhaps the sort of thing that you can just tuck away in the back of your mind, in the back, uh, maybe notes in the back of your Bible for when those sorts of difficult questions arise. Building block number one is this, doubt is real. Doubt is real, and you are not the first to experience it. It's fascinating to go back and watch over the shoulders of people who were wrestling with this even in the days of Jesus. John in John chapter 7 tells us that even Jesus' own brothers, we know the names of two of them, James and Jude, even his own brothers did not believe that Jesus really was who he claimed to be. There were women on that first day of the week, a Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead, women who had seen him with their own eyes, and they ran back and told some of his closest followers, men who had been walking with Jesus 
for three years. And when they went and they told those men what they had seen with their own eyes and heard with their own ears, they didn't believe those women. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus had prepared his disciples for what was going to occur in Jerusalem. He told them ahead of time in Matthew 20 and verse 18, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. They had been told that ahead of time. You have your Bible open there to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Begin reading with me in the 19th verse of the chapter. When now, after hanging for six hours on that cross, suspended between heaven and earth on that Friday. Now it is the evening of that day, the first day of the week. You read with me in John 20 and verse 19. The doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Can you imagine having seen what you have seen just a couple of days before? Huddled now in this locked room. Don't just read over that. And suddenly Jesus is standing among you and he says, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the sins uh, or if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now notice verse 24. Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, now they believe. They had women come and tell them, first of all, and they did not believe. Now they have seen the majority of them. And they tell Thomas, who was not there, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. You might keep your marker there in John chapter 20, a little piece of paper, whatever it is. We'll come back to John 20 in just a moment. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, just a little earlier in your New Testament. Back to Matthew chapter 28. Have you ever stopped to notice even at the scene of what we commonly call the Great Commission, where Jesus says, you go into all the world and you spread this news. You make disciples. At that very scene, at the close of Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 28 and verse 16, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But even then and there, some doubted. Building block number one, doubt is real. And you are not the first one to experience it. You go back where I asked you to mark your Bibles in John chapter 20. Building block number two, having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. Having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. Read with me, continuing in John chapter 20 and the 26th verse of the chapter. We have read that the majority of the apostles have seen the risen Jesus. Now it is eight days later in John 20 and verse 26, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, there it is again. This is no ordinary person 
Jesus comes and he stands among them and he says to them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Over and over again, Jesus demonstrates the fact that he knows. Even if he wasn't in a physical location, he knows what has happened there. Even if someone doesn't open their mouth and talk, he knows what is going on in their mind. He is so much more than just an incredible prophet from God. He is so much more than just a revolutionary teacher or or a profound worker of unexplainable miracles. He is God among us. God walking in the flesh. He knows the very words that Thomas had said eight days prior and Thomas the only thing that he can say in response is my Lord and my God in verse 29 Jesus said to him have you believed because you have seen me blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask why. It's okay to evaluate. We want you this evening to know it's okay. It's okay to to have a desire to tackle hard questions. And my personal encouragement to you would be to tackle those tough questions together with people who believe that this is God's book, who know what it is to wrestle with things that are hard to understand. And one of the basic, most foundational reasons that we are here this evening is the fact we believe God has equipped us with everything we need to find victory in rock-solid truth that he has provided in his word. Hear me when I say having doubts does not make you a bad person, but that leads us to building block number three. Doubts need to be handled and handled with care. Again, in our key text from John chapter 20 and verse 27, when Jesus said in the first part of that verse to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do you know what Jesus is inviting Thomas to do? Thomas, conduct an investigation. Having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. But Jesus' desire for Thomas is not that Thomas would just resign himself to the rest of his life being consumed with doubt or just checking out because I have these doubts and I don't have every answer to every question that I can possibly ask. No, Jesus doesn't come and and immediately strike him dead. He doesn't come and, and rebuke him for being an evil person. He invites Thomas to conduct an investigation. Let's stay in the Gospel of John. Go back with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Once again, an example of someone encouraged to do honest work in looking at the evidence. John chapter 10, here are Jews who are so enraged by what they are hearing. According to verse 31, they pick up stones again to throw at Jesus and stone him. They're going to throw rocks at him until they kill him. We'll begin reading in verse 32. Jesus answered, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? 
The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. They understood what he was claiming. The claim was clear. The miracles were beyond dispute. They couldn't capture him in his words. Which leads them to a fundamental fork in the road. Is he really who he claims to be? You look at verse 37 when he says, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. What is he challenging them to do? Doubts are real. These people weren't the first ones to experience it. You aren't the first. I am not the first to experience it. And having doubts doesn't automatically make you a bad person. But doubts ought not just to be left hanging there. Without honestly looking at the evidence. Without conducting an honest investigation. Without doing the work. That is what Jesus is challenging these people to do. Listen to my words. Look at my life. Look at the works that I am doing. Believe the works that you may know and understand. God's will for your life is not that you would be clouded in uncertainty for the rest of your time here. God is not playing a game with you. Trying to hide behind every possible corner and keep you from understanding what you need to understand in order to make the most of your time on this earth and ultimately live with him for eternity. But if you are going to know and understand, you've got to do the work. You've got to get to the point in your own spiritual development that you're willing to ask, why do I believe what I believe? Do I really believe this? Or am I just here because this is what me and my family have always done? You go with me to the very next to last book in the Bible, the book of Jude, the little book of Jude. We mentioned that Jesus' own brothers earlier did not believe in him. Here is one. And what has changed everything? What goes from here is Jesus of Nazareth dying on a cross to his own brothers willing to lay their lives on the line? Their brother that they saw die on a Roman cross spent 40 days walking among them. Weeks appearing to individuals, to small groups. Paul tells us at one point, appearing to more than 500 people at one time. This was not a ghost. It was not a fairy tale. It was not a hallucination. Jesus of Nazareth really rose from the dead. And now here is Jude in this little one chapter letter just before the end of the Bible. We begin reading in verse 17. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's make that real. What would your brother have to do in order to convince you that he was the Lord? Jude, for a very long time, didn't believe. Now he does. Because of the resurrection from the dead. In verse 18, they said to you, these apostles said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. 
waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Doubt is real. And you're not the first one to experience it. Doubt does not automatically make you a bad person. But listen, doubts need to be handled. Don't use doubt as an excuse to act as if God isn't there. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 challenges us. Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Listen to me. Truth has nothing to fear from honest investigation. Truth has nothing to fear of you putting in the hard work. But when I have doubts, what should I do? I'm being challenged over and over and over again to get to work. Don't bury the doubt. Don't ignore the doubt. Don't pretend. Don't keep it secret. Just because you haven't found the answer doesn't mean that there isn't an answer. Jude tells us doubts need to be handled with care. For those of us who have been walking with Jesus for a little longer, have mercy on those who doubt. Go with me to the Gospel of Mark, if you will. Mark chapter 9, building block number 4. When I'm struggling, I need to ask for help. Nothing earth-shattering here. But how many Christians are struggling and perhaps even to this very evening has been, have been unwilling to be honest and open and authentic and ask for help. In Mark chapter 9, you begin reading with me in verse 14 as Jesus is coming down from a very high mountain where just a few of them have, have noticed, have seen, had a, a front row seat as he is miraculously changed in front of them. They come down from this mountain in Mark 9 and verse 14 and they see a, a great crowd around them. And here are some scribes who are arguing with Jesus' disciples and immediately all of the crowd, when they saw him, they were greatly amazed and they ran up to him and they greeted him and he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. Can you imagine? As a parent watching that sort of thing happen to your child over and over and over again. And then hearing that perhaps there is hope in this Jesus of Nazareth and figuring out where he is and, and finally tracking him down and getting through the crowd only to find that some of his closest to followers are there. Jesus is up on a mountain and they don't know when he's going to come down. The, the father says at the end of verse 18, I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them in verse 19, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the Spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, 
How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Verse 22, it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, All things are possible for one who believes. Here is the father. He doesn't know what to think. He only knows that he is in perhaps the most desperate situation of his life. And he doesn't know the how and he doesn't know the what. And perhaps he doesn't even know if this who can deliver on what he's saying. But he's honest. In verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Mark continues on and tells us that when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. When I'm struggling, I need to ask for help. And it doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to be long. Perhaps it is. I believe. But I'm really struggling right now. And I need help. Could I suggest to you that one of the most revolutionary things you could do as a member of this local church. When you come in those back doors and and people are greeting you, how easy it is. People are people whether they live here or in Columbus or wherever they live, how easy it is to have have had one of the most difficult days that you've had in a long time. And you're really struggling. And you have to push yourself even to to get here. You know that you should be here and and you you push yourself to get here, but there's so many things going on and that there are issues at home and drama at work and, and perhaps you're really struggling in ways that maybe you've never struggled before. And you come in and people ask you how you're doing and suddenly you put on that plastic smile and you say, I'm fine. When you know and your creator knows You're not fine. And perhaps what is very tempting is just to keep that plastic smile on until you can't take it anymore. And the burden is is so great that you feel like you're being crushed by it. And the doubts that you haven't handled, you haven't asked for help, you haven't put in the the work to find the answers, and, and you're just suspended there. And it gets to the point where maybe you feel like you just need to disappear. All the while telling the people who love you the most, I'm fine. God blesses us in a whole lot of ways, but he doesn't ever bless us with the ability to read each other's minds. Doubt is real and you're not the first to experience it. And having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. Doubts need to be handled. They need to be handled with care. But when I'm struggling, I need to ask for help. Back in our key text from John chapter 20 and verse 27 where Jesus encourages Thomas, invites Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. 
Jesus knows where Thomas is. Thomas is essentially saying, I need help to believe. And Jesus encourages him to investigate. Honestly look at the evidence. Be careful how you investigate. Make sure that you're giving truth a fair hearing. Be careful who you're listening to. Perhaps it's breaking news that sometimes we take for granted, but especially our young people need to understand everything you see online isn't true. Anybody can put anything on YouTube. And that doesn't make it true. Be careful who you're listening to. Ask, seek, knock, and do that in order to find answers. Could, could I encourage you to think with me for just a moment about the difference between a, a question seeker and an answer seeker? Lots of people find it very interesting to come up with as many questions as they can possibly come up with without any real heart for finding the answers. They just like asking questions, especially if it disturbs other people. The question seeker is rarely satisfied with any answers. They just like trying to come up with unanswerable questions. Whereas the answer seeker has questions too, but they're able to recognize legitimate answers. And they're happy to find them. The question seeker's follow-up is something to the effect of, yeah, but what about? Whereas the answer seeker's follow-up is something to the effect of, now let me understand how to apply this. The question seeker mistakes a search for questions with a humble search for truth, whereas the answer seeker finds truth through humble acceptance of legitimate answers that God has provided in his word. The question seeker looks for clever ways to ask the question because they just want to stump other people, whereas the answer seeker looks for clarity, not to stump anyone, but to lead to solid conclusions. The question seeker sees the questions as an end in themselves since no answer in their mind is going to suffice. Whereas the answer seeker sees the questions as a means to find the real answer. The question seeker uses lack of answers as a reason to raise doubt. The answer seeker uses a lack of answers as a way to keep Seeking and finally trust in the one who does have the answers. The question seeker asks questions without learning much from them. The answer seeker asks questions in order to learn. The question seeker uses unanswered questions to suspend judgment about God and Christ and, and his will for my life. And the more questions I can ask, that means the longer I don't have to be committed. Whereas the answer seeker suspends judgment on an unanswered question, but they can still trust God. Which leads us finally to building block number five. Go back with me if you've turned your Bibles away to the Gospel of John chapter 20. We'll pick back up in verse 27. With great truth comes great responsibility. We've got this scene of Jesus and the apostles and, and Thomas. And Thomas has been convicted to the point where he is willing to say in verse 28, My Lord and my God. Jesus in verse 29 of John 20 says, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, John tells us, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written. Why? 
so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. John knows you weren't there. He knows I wasn't there. But John is saying everything you need in order to believe is right here. Believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Lamb provided by God for the sins of all the world. He is the Son of God. And you need to understand, John is communicating, this is the greatest truth in the universe. And with great truth comes great responsibility. You need to believe it. And by believing, you can have life in His name. Don't disbelieve, believe. The Holy Spirit is using John to communicate to us. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 before we're done. A little deeper into the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you begin reading with me in verse 1, where Paul roots everything that he is saying in this profound letter to Christians, to this anchor point of the, the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Notice that. It's our responsibility to receive it, to stand in it, and to be saved by it. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. What brought that man, transformed that man from persecutor now to prisoner for the Lord is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verse 12 of the same chapter, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Grasp that this evening. If Jesus is still in the grave, this is all pointless. Those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, they're just dead. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But notice the fact this man was willing to stake everything on. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He saw him with his own eyes. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. More including me and including you, will be raised. With great truth comes great responsibility. Paul would say it to, to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, don't quench the spirit, don't despise prophecies, test everything. Truth has nothing to fear. Test it. And what you find that is good, hold on to it. John issued the challenge in 1 John 4 and verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. Conduct the investigations. 
ask the difficult questions, be an answer seeker, and understand that you can, because of what God has preserved in his word, get to the point where you say with Paul in 2 Timothy 1, I'm not ashamed. I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. To Timothy, he says, you follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and the love that are in Jesus Christ. Doubt is real. And you are not the first to experience it. Having doubts doesn't make you a bad person. But doubts need to be handled with care. And when I'm struggling, I need to ask for help. God has provided great truth. And through his son, even this very evening, he continues to say, ask, seek. Knock. It may be even this evening that you have serious questions. And we would lovingly encourage you not to leave this building this evening without asking those questions. Let's open up our Bibles together and seek answers to those questions. It may be that you realize you have never responded to God in the way that his son prescribed just before ascending to his father in heaven Jesus said in all of his resurrected glory go into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature he who believes and is baptized will be saved he who does not believe will be condemned we ask you lovingly this evening have you done that and if not, why not? If you're a Christian and you need help this evening, what greater help could there possibly be as step one than to pray with you and for you to the God who reigns and loves you more than you could possibly imagine this evening? We would love to help you. We would love to pray with you and for you this evening. If we can be of any help, God has done everything that is necessary. Would you let us know how we can help by coming to the front while we stand and sing?